Welcome to Mind Shift Power Podcast, a show for teenagers and the adults who work with them, where we have raw and honest conversations. I'm your host, Fatima Bay, the Mind Shifter. And welcome, everyone. Today's episode is a little different. So today we have with us Erica Bess. She, you've heard her before. She is a therapist and she's been on a few episodes already, but here she's not today here as a therapist per se. She's here in a different capacity. So today she's going to do something very bold and very brave. And she's going to open up and talk about her personal experiences in what some of us would call prostitution. Prostitution is usually different than we think. And you're going to hear about that. So this is a two-part episode. So this is part one. And then make sure you listen to part two that will be released the same day. So we're going to have a raw and honest conversation about what prostitution looks like and what it doesn't look like. Now, before we get into that conversation, let me give you a couple of facts and figures. According to uh, DeliverFund.org, it is estimated that between 15,000 and 50,000 women and children are forced into sexual slavery in the United States every year. The total number varies wildly because it's actually difficult to research. So the real number might be bigger than that. There's really no way to tell. Most youth, another fact, and most youth tend to fail. I'm sorry. Most youth tend to fall victim to child prostitution and sex trafficking between the ages of 12 and 14. According to sexcrimeslaw.com, the average female enters into prostitution when she is only 16 or 17 years of age. Now, Erica was not 12 or 14 when she got into it. She was a little bit older. And there is a difference between sex slavery and prostitution. But I want you to know that that difference is primarily on paper only. In reality, they're not much different. I want you to know how serious and prevalent this actually is. Um, And Erica wasn't wasn't necessarily, quote unquote, trafficked in the way we usually think of trafficking but she was a sexually exploited youth. Thank you, Erica, for coming today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. All right, let's hop right into it. So uh, why don't we start off by you telling us how old you were when you got into prostitution and tell us your story. Okay, so I was 19. I had a late birthday, so it was my first year of college. And I was always a year older than I was supposed to be in school. So um, it was my first year in college. I literally had just dropped off my things in my dorm and unpacked. And it was my first day in a new city. And I was going to go out with my friend to explore, but she ended up canceling. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to just go by myself. So I was 19 years old exploring the city. And that's when I ran into my future pimp. Okay. Yeah. And tell us more about how, how did, <clears throat> well, so I was you, walking, you met him and what happened? <laughs> I met him. He um, stopped me on the street. He was walking the opposite direction from me. We're actually passing each other. And he goes, excuse me, miss. I guess I looked like, you know, I wasn't from there and I'm looking all around at all the buildings and everything like, wow, this is so nice. And he's like, excuse me, miss. Can I give you a compliment? And I, had this really pretty dress on. And I was like, sure. And then he goes, well, my compliment is a little X rated. So can I still give it to you? And then I busted out laughing. Now, not knowing that he was starting his game on me immediately. Because if Mm -hmm. he had said, "Um, I want to give you a compliment, but it's X rated. And I said, ew, disgusting. And I kept it moving. That would have been the end of it. Done deal. But because I laughed and I thought that was funny, he was like, okay, she's one of the ones I can try, you know? So Mm -hmm. he um, had a rolly bag with him and he said he was going to go 
somewhere later, but it seemed like he didn't have anywhere to go at the time. And he just started walking with me and talking with me. And then we basically spent the whole day together. Um, He was getting to know me. Um, I told him I was in school. Um, He told me that he was into like writing music and that he worked for a prevalent um, agency that was like well known for music and that he did like ghost writing. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. And that sometimes he did like background, you know, guitar for other artists when they came into town. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but I was 19 and he was 49, and which was only a few years um, younger than my mother and my father at the time. Wow. Yeah. So, but he did not look that way. Unfortunately, <laughs> is, is, that, is that common? Yes. It's, mm-hmm. men, uh, men who are into that lifestyle tend to be older and they tend to seek out younger women because younger women are easier to um, mold and get under Mm -hmm. their control. Mm -hmm. And as a woman who's older would be a little bit more aware of like the red flags and be like, no, Mm -hmm. you're not going to do that to me. And, but a young woman who's just fresh out of their home and never really got to see the world yet, like bright eyes open and ready. And you know, that, that saying they saw me, they saw you coming. He saw me coming. Okay. Yep. So fast forward to um, what, led into or the the uh, let me say the pathway into you starting to do sex for money for him okay so we had spent the whole day together and then we ended up at this place where he was playing pool and he mentioned something about uh being crooked and I was like well what does that mean because I thought crooked meant you're like a bad person he was like no crooked just means um, that you are financially hungry and you're willing to do almost anything to get it. So Mm. he was like, I know you're a young 19 year old struggling college student. Wouldn't you like it if you didn't have to work so hard um, and get money and Mm. do the easiest thing possible to get money? And then of course I'm like, my ears are like wide open. I was like, well, what, what do I have to do? He's like, you barely have to do anything. Um, Mm -hmm. and he was like, Oh, I was like, Oh, okay. And then he made me wait like a whole day or two, um, because he didn't want to say exactly what it was. But at the end of that night that we spent together, he was already talking me out of money up from my ATM. He was like, in order for me to give you this information of what you're going to be doing, you have to, um, invest into what we're going to be doing. And I was like, okay, but it's like top secret. Like, well, what did it, what is it? He was like, well, you decide how much you want to put down towards it. And I had just gotten like my refund from my school tuition. So I had a couple of hundred dollars and I I was like, okay, whatever you need to do, I got it. And he's like, we'll meet again and we'll, we'll discuss the details. So I went to, by the end of the night, I'm going to the ATM and I'm taking out like, I think $150 for this man. Don't even know him from a stranger, like a pain on the wall, but I'm giving him my money. And he's like, okay, we'll, we'll reconvene in a couple of days and I'll let you know the logistics of everything. And I'm like, okay. So then, then I go back and meet him a couple of days later. And he's like, the eye, the look in your eyes have changed since you met me. And I was like, maybe because I'm like intrigued by you and I want to know how I can make all this money. So he said at first that, I could be with a man just to pay for my time for me spending like an hour with a person. And he didn't say anything about sex at first. He was like, I can train you to be so good at this that you won't even have to do anything except have a conversation with somebody for an hour and you can get $300 just like that. And he said, if you are willing to, you could also get into being a dominatrix and don't have to have sex with anybody and just end up like beating on somebody for an hour and then getting your money like that. So he was like bringing like these different ideas to me. And I was like, I don't know if I could do that. But he was like, well, it's up to you. He was like, how do you think um, most of these women are out here getting their money? He was like, they have side hustles. And he's like, you can do it if you just follow my lead. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. 
And then we kind of left that alone for a while. And then I feel like I went through a period of grooming where he eventually became my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me all the things that I wanted to hear. He was giving me the attention that I needed uh, or that I thought I needed from him. And then it slowly led to, okay, now you're my girlfriend. And then I said to him, well, if you still want me to, you know, be with these men for money, wouldn't you get jealous because I'm your girlfriend? He said, the only way that I would get jealous of you interacting with other men is if you didn't make them pay for your time. And I was like, oh, okay. So as long as they're paying, then he's, he feels like he's on top. And, Mm. um, that's how I got into it. So we would go into clubs around the area and kind of like scope out the scene. And if anybody, he said, if any man comes up to talk to you, he automatically wants to have sex with you. And I was like, how do you figure that? He was like, trust me. He's like, a man doesn't talk to a woman unless he wants to have sex with her. And he's like, um, he can be in the background, act like we don't know each other. And he could look at a person and tell if they were the right type of person to be a trick. And a trick is somebody who's willing to pay for sex. Right. So I was like, okay. So I eventually got into it like that because I was interested in making easy money. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Did you think you were sexually ex- being sexually exploited at the time? At first, no. But then knowing the truth about things and seeing that I was uncomfortable with the situation and realizing that I was chipping away at my spirit as a person, I was like, no, I'm, I'm prostituting and this is not healthy for me spiritually. So but, I didn't realize that first, it. but I kept doing it. Kept doing it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And the, was it the money that motivated you to keep doing it? Yeah. Cause I was going to school full time and I didn't want to work like a regular job mm-hmm. and Uh, I would have gotten like only like part-time hour pay at minimum wage. And he was like, you could be doing so much better than that. And you can have this lifestyle if you just follow what I say and, you know, just map it out for you. And I was okay with it for a while. But then I realized the compromise that it was having on me spiritually. And I told him, I don't think I can do this anymore. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, "I, I don't know. I really don't. I don't think I can. It's just not right for me. And he said, well, okay, well, if you don't want to do it, then you got to bring some girls uh, to me to, to get into it because I need some form of income. And I'm like, but don't you write music and all this other stuff, which was also a facade I found out. He knew mm-hmm. people who were in the industry, but he really wasn't who he said he was, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and if he did write some stuff, he never even got credit for it. Um, like his name was never put down on any of the masters and the records and Mm. things like that. So he was getting paid under the table. So, um, he tells me I have to bring uh, other women into it and that's the only way I can get out of it. And he said he could train me to be a madam, which is a female pimp basically. And I was like, okay, well, if that's the way I can get out of it, then I'll bring you somebody. No problem. As long as I don't have to do it anymore. Cause I'm done with this. So, uh, we would go to clubs or places in the city that had like, like a lot of women and it was like a function. And I would look for, he would train me to look for women who are by themselves. You don't want to approach a woman as a pimp with a bunch of women with them because there's going to be women who are looking out for their friend's safety in a group and Mm -hmm. you you target women who are alone. Okay. So (laughs) when you're, when you're a pimp and you're looking for people to recruit, to prostitute for you and bring you an income, you're going to target women who are by themselves because women in large groups of friends are going to try to protect the, the female that's being targeted. So it usually causes the pimp to not get a successful person in recruition because the pers- the people are surrounded by friends that care about them. But if you are a single woman walking around on your own, you are a target for these predators. Very good point to make, uh, Erica, because you're absolutely right. They know what to look for. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into that a little bit more. What specifically, besides being alone, what made you a good target? Oh, it was like a recipe for disaster. Well, as a child, I had a, a instance of molestation and then my father wasn't in the household and 
after my molestation, my mother kind of like uh, distanced herself physically and emotionally connecting to me um, for whatever reason. And that was like a perfect storm for me to have lower self-esteem than I should have had for myself. Mm -hmm. And when I went off into college, um, it was like a brand new world. And I was just like, Dorothy and the at the Wiz and I'm just like oh my gosh everything's so wonderful this is great I'm finally on my own and then somebody saw me and was like oh she's an attractive female and she's by herself and let me let me pick her brain to see if her self esteem is where it needs to be because if it was he wouldn't have been able to do that to me but because it wasn't where it needed to be he was like oh perfect let me work on her and groom her into this. I'm going to take a break right here and and talk to the audience. I want you guys to know that what Erica is describing, she's describing her own personal experiences, which is not everyone's, but it is common, extremely, extremely common. And those, I'm going to branch out a little bit because we're talking about prostitution here, but a lot of what she just described, domestic abusers look for too. They look for the women they consider weak. And the ones who are the weakest are the ones who don't know who they are yet and have low self-esteem. Quite a common theme amongst those who are looking to victimize women for one reason, whether to date them, whether to beat them, whether to sexually exploit them. They're still looking to victimize women for whichever reason. The thing that they all have in common is what you just said. They're looking for someone who doesn't know who they are, which is why I'm so adamant about make uh, teaching young women who they are and encouraging them and building them up so that they are less likely to be the next victim. I want to reduce their victim pool. Hopefully piss them off enough. That'll be great for me. (laughs) Now I would love that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Now tell me what else you looked for when you were looking for other women to, to, to bring into the life and turn over to him what did you look for? Single females, young, not over 25, but over 18. Um, maybe a female who looks that they're looking for somebody, but maybe they didn't show up. There was one instance where there was a girl who kept ch- constantly checking her phone and looking around her surroundings. Like she was waiting for people to come, but they didn't show up. And... Um, he saw her first and he, he like alerted my attention. He was like, go talk to her over there. She's, she's one of us. And I was like, how how does he, how does he even know this? But he knows. So I go over there and I talk to her and we end up talking and then I introduce her to him. And she's like, he's like, Hey, do you want to go to the bar or something? Were you waiting for somebody and they didn't show up? And she's like, yeah. She's like, flaky friends and he's like don't worry we're we're just gonna go hang out at the pool hall and just you know hang out and he she right. was like if you're not doing anything come come on with us and I think she felt safe because I was there when you see another female who seems friendly but in yeah. that instance I was being a predator so yes. so I she, it's dangerous and you think that you see a female that it's okay it must be safe don't let that fool you I always no. like to say, the devil's not going to walk up to you and say, hey, I'm Satan. Want to come with me? He's not. <laughs> He's going to come as an angel of light. He's going to look all pretty. Mm-hmm. And we and we tend to, not just in this subject, but in other areas, we tend to fall for mm-hmm. um, demons and angel outfits. Mm-hmm. And that's why he sent <laughs> and, me and then mm-hmm. watered, her, watered her up to get to, okay, now it's me that you have to meet. And he did the same thing that he did to me and told her, hey, I have a, I have a compliment for you. It's a little X rated. And she cracked up, too. And then it was the same game that he ran on me. He was running on her in front of me. And this is something that is. Uh, so it, it this happens a lot. And so I want to reiterate, uh, point out some things that you'd said. What I heard was manipulation. Mm-hmm. And would you cons- would you say that he controlled you? Yes, mentally. That's bingo. That's what I wanted to point out. He, did he beat you? Never. Never put a hand to. on me. He, he didn't, didn't have, have to. to. He controlled your mind. Yeah. He, he, he put a uh, a leash around your brain and mm-hmm. controlled you that way. 
And he even used that to point out to me, I'm not like these pimps on the street that's going to smack you up and down the street and tell you, bitch, where's my money? I don't have Mm -hmm. to do that. He's like, I don't even look like a pimp. What do pimps look like to you? Uh, All gaudy and flashy. That's a whole yeah, conversation. we're gonna talk about right? that in, the, yeah, in, in part two of this conversation. We are gonna actually talk right. about that, but but yes, and I want to point that out to the listeners and especially young women who are listening right now. He did to you what uh, is often referred to as love bombing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one term for it. There's actually several terms for it, but mm-hmm. I'm gonna use that term right now. Uh, love bombing, which is oh, you're great. Let me. Uh, let me show you some that I care. Let me show you that I'm nice. And, oh yeah. Uh, let me manipulate you into. Let me manipulate into what I want. He didn't just come right up to say, "Yo, bitch, want to be my hoe?" I mean, right. no one's gonna respond. Right. No to one that. really says it like that. Sure. <laughs> no, he was Yay. so charming and everything, right. and I was just so mesmerized that this older guy was interested in me, and I was mm-hmm. 19 fresh out of the the home and I'm like oh wow this cute 49 year old guy who didn't really look 49 he looked nice for his age and then uh, I was like you know enthralled and then when we started having sex he opened up my world to sex in a whole nother level that I had never experienced I was like oh my god I was really open then like with the mental manipulation I was like super susceptible and also I want to point out for um, the young women who are listening there is never a situation where a 49 year old is interested in a girl that young where it's not yeah. predatory it a hundred percent of the time one way or another it's predatory even yeah. if they are a family friend it's still predatory Definitely. so keep that in mind we're going to end it here for now and if you want to hear the rest of erica's story and we want to talk about more details about what does a pimp look like because most of y'all have it wrong <laughs> and uh and several other things we're going to talk about that in part two of this episode so stay tuned thank you for listening to mind shift power podcast please like and subscribe to my youtube channel at the mind shifter if you have any comments topic suggestions or would like to be a guest on the show please visit fatimabay.com slash podcast remember there's power in shifting your thinking Tune in for next week.